guys. Welcome to another edition of Get the Puck Out presented by TarpsOffHockey.net. I am your host, Chris Mancuso, and we are back with another little one-on-one episode. And Leafs fans, hockey's coming back. We had to bring in a Toronto legend, the one and only John Derringer of Q107. He also has the Derringer Morning Podcast as well, right? So how's everything going, John? Excellent, Chris. Thanks for having me again, buddy. Uh, yeah, I think, you know what? Things are, things are good. We're, we're not going to forget 2020 anytime soon. No, no. Crazy night. Um, I mean, crazy year, sorry. And it's been uh, one thing after another, whether it was COVID, whether it was like some tough celebrity deaths that we've seen in sports world things and just like, you know, this pandemic and even watching the sports. Um, how have you found so far? I mean, soccer's back. The MLS is back. How have you found watching sports outside of hockey uh if you've caught any with no fans in the arena i have not not so much the the bundesliga a little bit here and there but more uh more auto racing and and i think auto racing is probably the sport where the crowd interacts visually on tv at, at the least so you don't really notice it there um but I tell you, you know, with with hockey, there's still a ton of questions to, to be asked and answered. But, Chris, when this whole thing started, I thought, you know, this is like going to the casino and standing at a table and watching some guy chase his money because that's essentially what they're doing. Uh, but then I started to think, well, you know what, sometimes it's fun to watch somebody chase their money. And sometimes sometimes if you're rooting for the guy, he gets his money back. And I think that's, that's kind of the way I've turned it as a hockey fan. It, it looks like it's coming together reasonably well. It was amazing to see teams back on the ice on Monday. And once, once, once I heard, and I think, I, I think a lot of people agree, you know, it was the, the sound of skates on ice, pucks hitting up, you know, off the goalpost or the crossbar, uh, little chirps here and there, all that stuff. And I went, okay, I, I'm, I'm 100% in it. Yeah, exactly. It's like angelic music when you see something holy, when you start hearing those hockey uh, so those hockey sounds. So Toronto, Edmonton, the NHL does the right thing and puts both hub cities in Canada. Were you surprised to see them actually do that? I mean, I know the, the state's COVID numbers aren't well, but just to actually put both hub cities in in Canada, I thought was, was a pretty bold statement from the NHL as like, you know, they actually want to get this thing completed. Cause I think the NBA and that they're going to have a hard time down there. Yeah. It's every sport for themselves at this point, you know, baseball doing something radically different than yeah. what either the NBA or the NHL are doing. Um, yeah. I, I thought they'd want to throw the, you know, Chicago or LA a bone if they could, uh, of course you, you, you want, you would like to have put it in a, in a big, big market, but really once the games start, I don't know how much we're going to care where they're being played anymore. No. Right? And I mean, especially when there's no fans, right? Because hockey, like you said, with the, with the cars and the racing, like, yeah, the fans aren't as much, but like your home building can turn the course of an entire game. And you know, so like for Toronto, for example, it, it's not really a benefit to playing on the home ice at all because there's no atmosphere, there's no fans. So it's going to be really interesting to see that. And I don't think there was much of an economic boom uh, as far as having the games played there either. Um, I know a couple hotels will benefit, but yeah, if they're not really taking tickets and that, it was all about safety. And I'm glad that they didn't just put one in the U.S. and one in Canada because they had to. It seems like they're like, no, you know, like teams like Florida, Arizona, they need this season to finish the final TV money to probably even scrape even most years. So and it's good to see that. Like, yeah, like you said, I didn't think we were going to be able to get this off the ground. Uh, and, and now August 1st, I mean, we're sitting here, what, almost just about two weeks away. So pretty interesting to see and a good job to uh, in the NHL as well uh, extended the CBA for the first time. Like I'm 30 years old. They've had a lockout every time since 1994. Were you surprised to see them also get the extension done too? Or? Well, only because they had this massive thing, this big, huge, you know, 24 ounce porterhouse sitting on their plate already. There wasn't much room. Yeah, they the couldn't do that. Yeah. Else, but somehow they stuffed uh, a CBA in there, which I think was a really, really nice bonus, a totally unexpected one. Would have thought maybe they'd get this done and then continue to yeah, work Yeah, I the thought CBA. they would, like, extend it until the end of this season because I know it would have expired uh, at a different date, but they had already agreed to extend it. So just getting the extra six years of labor piece mm -hmm. is it, pretty incredible, too, for hockey fans everywhere. Now, 
John, you're a radio personality in Toronto. You know how the media is. Toronto will be, even though there's no fans there, do you think there's an added pressure for the Leafs now that, like, you know, they're doing these games in Toronto? Or do you, do you think it really matters? You know, I, I think there is added pressure, Chris, but I don't, I don't think it's because it's in Toronto. I, I think it's, it's because of where the team is at in the, you know, rebuild, still a rebuild, I guess, they, but they're, you know, they're advanced uh, far enough that, they, you know, no one would say they're at the beginning of the rebuild. But I think the team has a, a rather limited window before. Yeah, the time now, is now, right? right? Yep. Yeah. When you look at the, the salary cap, probably not moving for a couple more years, the Leafs are one of those teams that, that are going to find themselves in a bit of a problem there. Yeah. Um, but, but I can't help but think that right now their youth is going to be an amazing benefit. I mean, let me ask you, how do you, even, how do you even handicap a tournament like this? I mean, we've never seen this before. You're almost better off comparing a team and the way they start a season traditionally to the way they play in the playoffs because we've had more than a regular summer's worth of, of time off for the players already. I think a big part of it, particularly in the play-in round, is going to be which teams really did their best work during the, the four months they were off. Who really kept in shape? Who did everything they could to be ready for game one, those teams are going to have a massive advantage in a three out of five series. Yeah, and one thing if you're a Leafs fan, and I wrote about this uh, last week, was if it does go like, you know, you kind of have to look at it. Who's traditionally a fast starting team? Well, if you look at the last five to, to, to even, you could even say 10 years, the Toronto Maple Leafs, they always start hot. And by the time April comes, they're gassed. Freddie Anderson has played 65, 70 games. And then, or, you know, he, and like they give up close to the most shots in the NHL in any given season. Now they have arrested Freddie Anderson. They're going to have all this youth, young guys who, you know, I, I feel like Austin Matthews, William Melander, Kapanen, uh, Janssen, Tavares, to a lesser extent, he's not as youthful. But, I mean, like, these guys, these kids should come out flying, right? So if Freddie Anderson's healthy, they come out flying, and there's an opportunity for all the other fan bases across the league to put an asterisk next to it Next to it, if they do win. I think this could bode well for the Toronto Maple Leafs to uh, get over this playoff hump and, and potentially take a team like the Boston Bruins out of the playoffs. Uh, they're, they're, you know how it is in Toronto. They're, they're a notorious fast-starting team. Well, and, and, and at some point, we got to get past Boston, right? I mean, every Leaf fan knows that. I mean, it could be a scenario, sure, where the Leafs win a series and Boston gets beaten by somebody else, and we, we don't have to beat them directly in that case, but we still have to beat the team that just beat them. Yeah. Um, but personally, Chris, I really want to see the Leafs beat the Boston Bruins at some point. I think this team is good enough now, and if, if you haven't, if you haven't tasted the disappointment that two losses, and most of these guys have been here for two losses to the Boston Bruins. Let's not even think about 2013, right? Yeah, which this was the most was heartbreaking of all. Hey, for sure. But I, uh, when you look at these last two, you go, I can't imagine these guys wouldn't want a piece of the Boston Bruins right now. I get the feeling there's a great confidence on the team too. That may be every one of the 24 teams that's in here feels confident. They do all to a certain extent. But I like the way the, this young team is situated heading into this. Yeah. And, okay. But saying that, you mentioned Freddie. Freddie doesn't have a great start. They get off. They lose two games in a row. The they, playoffs could last. Be finished. Last yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's really going to be interesting. So now you know that the way that hockey is played, it's not a game played on paper. One of these play-in teams is going to make it through. So – I got my likely candidates. If you were to pick who would be more likely, a Montreal upset over the Pittsburgh Penguins or an Edmonton Oilers getting upset by the Chicago Blackhawks, what do you think is more likely? Ooh, I, I would say the more likely would probably be the Blackhawks beating the Oilers. That uh, Pittsburgh, okay, well, you, you look at Pittsburgh, stars the exact opposite of the Leafs, right? City ain't 22 anymore, right? No. So. But if, there, if there's anything that Sidney Crosby has shown us, and, and, and Gino to a certain extent, but certainly Crosby's, this guy shows up prepared. He just, oh, yeah. part, of, part of what makes Sidney Crosby 
you can't be Sidney Crosby without without being prepared, always being in game shape, always being in your top mental focus. I, I understand what you're saying 100%. That makes sense. For me, I'm going to go with the Montreal Canadiens and only because of Carey Price. Uh, Carey, this is a best of five, right? Like you've seen, uh, I remember Jocelyn Tebow back in like the 2000s in a span of like a game six and seven versus the Boston Bruins made like 94 combined saves across two of those games. And like, if any goalie can do it, it's Carey Price, right? That's the only reason I say that. I don't think Chicago has the goaltending, but uh, they, they do certainly have the uh, Stanley Cup playoff experience, the championship experience. Uh, Jonathan Taze, Patrick Kane, Brent Seabrook, Duncan Keith, all those guys there for three championships in Chicago. So no, I, I get why you would pick that up there. So I want to bring things on into the draft. So like Toronto, yeah, it's bad if they don't get through Columbus, but if they don't get through Columbus, all of a sudden you have a one and eight shot at Alexis Lafreniere. What did you yeah. think about the NHL running a draft lottery show for an hour in which there was no winner in the end? And uh, do you think it's right that these play-in teams have a chance at the first overall pick? Well, I mean, that only could happen in the NHL, right? Yeah, I mean, the only league that could sure. ever happen in, yeah. Yeah, for sure, yeah. The, the other one's no problem, but number one's still sitting there. Uh, and we, we've seen weird things happen with the draft lottery before, but th this one, I think, uh, certainly takes the cake. Um, hey, it's a really nice consolation prize for some team that is, you know, rallying all their troops. They're coming to Toronto or Edmonton. They're going to play games. They're going to lose that play in series. And then they're going to get Lafreniere. I mean, a massive consolation prize. But, but I, I guess the way that they do it, I mean, is so convoluted. I, st I have no idea what they did. Yeah, something like ping pong balls and these teams had a chance. I, I don't get the lottery myself either. But when it came down to just not knowing the winner in the end, you said it right off the hop. That's the most NHL. Only the NHL could that happen. No other league would that ever happen. Um, that being said, it it's just like a double-edged sword for these teams. It's like if you get beat out, now you're just in a one-of-eight lottery chance to get left in the air. That's not so bad. This kid's uh, – you know, he's he looks like – as I know it gets thrown around pretty loosely, but like a generational talent. I think the last player we saw that legitimately had like a generational talent might be Austin Matthews, right? So um, as, as far as I can recall off the hop as someone who's like generational potential, Alexis Lafreniere is that and more. That kid is, is, is unbelievable. So a team like Toronto, if they happen to get beat by Columbus, which could happen, John Tortorella, you saw what they did to the Tampa Bay Lightning last year. I know they don't have those same guys, but who would have ever thought the Columbus Blue Jackets would be where they are and when you look at in terms of where the league was but when uh COVID went down the blue jackets were one of the most banged up teams in the league they didn't have their goalie uh felino guys like that were all hurt now all of a sudden they're going to be coming in healthy with their goalie so who knows what's going to happen but if you're toronto and you get beat out and you get lafreniere that opens up a world now where you can move one of those high priced forwards and grab a defenseman or two right so who knows how this is all going to shake out i see positives for toronto because i think if they get through they're going to actually finally get out of the first round of the playoffs or whatever it'll technically be this time i think if they get through columbus they're going to go on a little run but if not lafreniere that would make a, a couple guys up front william nylander on a big cap hit and other guys like that you could make those guys expendable and get some defense right can you imagine if lafreniere was a big solid right-handed defenseman oh my god he would be the most valuable guy but you know what you you brought it up earlier the salary cap not going up maybe for years and brian burke said five years possibly because they're gonna probably lose the gate for all the rest of this season there'll probably be no fans next season he thinks it could stay flat capped for five years so you look at the st louis blues they have two million dollars to re-sign alex petrangelo and vince dunn that's not going to happen. They needed that extra four, five, six million dollar increase to that to even be a possibility. So Tyson Berry comes off the books. If Toronto in a perfect world, I mean, not in a perfect world, but say they get beat out and then in a perfect world, they get that first overall pick. You can move out a salary and pitch Alex Petriangelo, a local kid, like that kind of defenseman would, would bring the Leafs into the next level. Well, and, 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 and for sure, and, and what you get is plus plus, right? I mean, you're talking about, as you say, a, a generational talent and one that a lot of teams could really use. Not to suggest that the Leafs couldn't, but it would be a ridiculous embarrassment of riches if you were to add 
Lafreniere to the forward lineup. They it are, would be insane. Would... It would be insane, it, but it would it, allow them to fix those potholes on the back end that have cost them the last two years. Mm -hmm. And there would be teams salivating at a chance, especially oh, yeah. if, they, if they had if they had a player that they thought they weren't going to be able to assign. But you know, you made good, made a good point about Columbus. Maybe if you're looking, you know, positively for the Leafs, maybe that Columbus is the perfect team to play in this play-in because you're a better team than they are, but you're going to have to work really hard to be. Oh them, yeah. Right. And that, that call it what you will grit, all the things that we've talked about that the Leafs may be lacking. If they want to beat the Columbus blue jackets and Tampa showed us how not to beat them last year. If you want to beat them, there are things you're going to have to do. There are commitments you're going to have to make. And, and, and if they're able to successfully get through that series, that opens up. Exactly, that. because that's as tough a team. John Tortorella coaches just a like, very, very defensive style of hockey. His guys buy in or they don't play, right? Like that's the kind of coach everybody knows Tortorella, how he runs his ship. And the guys in Columbus, they seem to be a gritty team. Like you said, if Toronto gets through them and they, they have to take on, a, even if it's a five-game hard series, man, it could that, that could be the kind of series that, you know, Boston and Columbus are very similar teams. I think that'll help them on the path to slaying the dragon, so to speak. But, I mean, we're sitting here almost August 1st. Um, how do you see it shaking down for the Leafs here? You think they're going to get through Columbus off the hop? I, I, I think they certainly can. I think they're, they're good enough. Uh, if, they, if they come out hot, which there's no reason to believe they won't. We know Columbus is going to. We, we know, and I agree with you 100% on, on Tortorella. Yeah, but, but I think we're assuming that they have kept their level of fitness and their uh, commitment to uh, you know being in shape and all the things you would expect of athletes of this nature um for the last four months it's got to be really weird the first time they came out uh, onto the ice i think it's going to be equally weird the first time they play a game mm -hmm. in the big rink with no crowds one of the questions i ask to myself and obviously we're not going to get an answer to this until it happens is is the intensity that we're going to get going to come anywhere near to the intensity of that same game being played with 18,000 people there. Yeah. I hope so, but I can't say for sure. Yeah. Who knows? Cause I mean, like I said, the fans drive so much of the emotion in the building, right? Which then the players either use for motivation or they use it as a spark. Maybe someone that, you know, guys get booed and that, that motivates them, but yeah, just to not have the interaction, it is going to be really crazy to see what the atmosphere is going to be like. And I mean, the Stanley cup's still on the line, right? So you would hope that the players are putting the body out and playing as hard, but just like with the atmosphere and with the circumstance, you're right. It's going to be very, very uh, interesting to see. So John, before we get the playoffs going, um, and, and everything here, you're going to be, uh, where are you going? You said you're going on vacation up north. Where are you headed to? Just going to head up to the cottage, uh, an hour and a half or so north of here. Going to hang out with the family. And my goal is to not open Twitter for two weeks. That's my number one goal. Everything else comes second. I just, just want to take a break for a couple of weeks. And That's right. Just hang out with the family and, uh, and enjoy uh, cottage country. That's it. Okay, John, well, I bet you have a lot to do before you do that. I want to thank you for joining us on the Get the Puck Out podcast presented by TarpsOffHockey.net. If you guys want to follow John Derringer on Twitter after his hiatus, he won't be tweeting very much. He just told you that, but he's still a great follow at John Derringer. Uh, you can catch him on Q107 in the morning, the Derringer in the morning show, as well as the Daily Derringer podcast. John, my friend, always good seeing you. Can't wait to talk to you further this season, uh, especially now that I got the, the website up and running, man. Uh, always good to talk weeks with you. Love to have another chat with you as we get into this uh, at the end of this month and then the real game's August 2nd for the Leafs. Yeah, let's get after it. We'll definitely book something through that time. John, great seeing you, my friend. Enjoy cottage country. Chris, thank you very much, buddy. Cheers.